this is Mr. Coates and this is Apes Lecture number 54 on oceanic pollution. Oceans tend to collect uh, quite a lot of the pollutants that come off the land from uh, man's activities. You can see on this picture over here with uh, the beach, uh, there's just tons of floating debris that washes up. Even on islands where no one lives out in the middle of uh, the Pacific Ocean or even the Atlantic Ocean where no one lives, it's just tons of trash that just washes up. We also have problems with oil pollution in the ocean and uh, we'll talk about uh, what those issues are there. This photo shows more trash uh, mostly from like fishing nets that uh, fishermen leave out in the ocean and lose and so they get wrapped around marine organisms, birds, turtles, in this case even whales. So these are some of the things that we see with uh, oceanic. Alright so let's talk about dredging first of all. When we dredge areas to create ship channels or even to re-nourish beaches that sediment is moved around and so we disturb the bottom of the ocean so that can destroy benthic habitats especially if we do it like in coral reefs where channels have been built right through the middle of the reef where they destroy the actual reef itself to build a channel to get boats in and out when you dredge you stir up all the bottom uh, of the the water here this, this is a dredge here and so they're spinning all the dredge material out here in the water and so that creates a plume of silty water and that increases turbidity which is a measurement of the clarity of the water and turbidity can be a problem for those organisms that are photosynthetic that need light it can also bury organisms very quickly that are on the bottom the other thing that dredging does is that it may release heavy metals that have settled out to the bottom things like lead and zinc mercury and copper and these things are all toxic to marine organisms and so you can resuspend these when you dredge. The other thing it can do, it can also increase your BOD. We've talked about BOD in our other water quality uh, talks, and BOD is biological oxygen demand. And so when you disturb those sediments, you'll disturb organic material at the bottom as well, and that could increase your BOD and lower oxygen levels throughout the water column. When we release sewage into the ocean, you can do that as well. This barge right here is actually releasing sewage. It's a barge full of sewage is being pulled through the ocean and it's releasing this big plume of human sewage that will eventually be treated by the bacteria in the ocean but at, in the short term it, the bacteria actually creates problems. Lots of fecal coliform bacteria and pollutants. Um, if they do this they want to do this really far offshore. This happens a lot in developing countries. You don't see this too much in the United States anymore although it used to happen quite a lot. Also cruise ships, for example. Cruise ships, when they get out in the open ocean, they discharge their sewage right into the water as well. Sometimes some ships will treat it, but most ships just discharge once they get out of a certain zone. Also dredging can, be, can occur not only to create channels, but also to create land. For example, here in Tampa Bay, we have a lot of areas in the bay and off of Pinellas County where they actually dredged the inland areas to create land for building houses. These are called finger canals here. So you got these long fingers of water right here and you have these areas of land that have been dredged up from these areas of water. And these areas were built mostly in the 40s and 50s and somewhat in the 60s. The problem with these is that we destroyed quite a lot of mangrove habitat and also quite a lot of seagrass habitat because the seagrasses in this area got buried or they got dredged up and put in this upland area where houses can be built. And also this obviously increased BOD during that time, increased turbidity during that time. But currently what happens, even though these are have been constructed for long periods of time now, during the summer months when it gets really hot, the water quality in these finger canals is very poor because there's hardly any flushing that goes on in them. And so you get areas of very low dissolved oxygen in these areas. And eventually these areas will also fill up with more silt and they'll have to be dredged out again. So these finger canals can be very detrimental in the long term for the environment. In Tampa Bay, they continuously dredge the ship channels. So this is North Tampa Bay, um, and so this is the Alifia River here, and this is the main ship channel that comes up through Tampa Bay. Right there beside the ship channel are these two large islands. These are called spoil islands, and the spoil from Tampa Bay now gets put inside these islands. And that's a good thing for the most part because it doesn't put the spoil right back out in the water where it can cause turbidity problems and on those heavy metal problems that I talked about previously. And it builds some uplands here uh, where birds can nest and things like that. These two islands are actually off limits to people and they create a lot of habitat for a lot of our wading birds here in uh, Tampa Bay. 
Now, oil is also a big pollutant problem in the world's oceans. We always hear about major oil spills when they happen worldwide, and they make huge headlines in the news. When uh, a big tanker runs aground or a drilling rig explodes, it makes news and you see all this oil and you see these huge catastrophes with wildlife getting coated with oil, specifically birds. So you think that these large oil spills are the biggest oil polluter in, in the world. However, these large scale events, even though they seem really bad and they appear bad on the news, that's not where most of the oil comes from. Most of the oil in the world's oceans actually comes from non-point sources off our roads, like this. All, all the roads throughout the world, the cars drip oil, they drip grease, and then the next rain that comes, it washes all this right into the nearest water body. And majority of the oil that gets in the world's ocean comes from this non-point source, not from events like this one-time event, although this is what the news kind of keys on. Also, when you're walking around, specifically on the Atlantic coast in Florida and up and down the Atlantic coast of the United States, every once in a while, if you walk on the beach, you get these tar spots on your feet. These are from tar balls that have washed up on the shore from oil spills or releases of oil into the ocean. Now, let's talk about some large oil spills that have happened uh, recently because these do make headlines and they become uh, important events to talk about when it comes to FRQs. So one major event happened in 1989. This is the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and this occurred in Prince William Sound in Alaska. And what happened is that this uh, large oil tanker, which had just filled up with its whole cargo container with crude oil from uh, the Alaskan oil fields and was starting to leave the sound. Unfortunately, the sound has a very thin channel. It's not a very wide channel at all. So there's a lot of rock outcroppings close to the channel. The other thing was is that the captain uh, was uh, under the influence of alcohol and was actually taking a nap to try and sleep it off. And so the second mate was in charge of the vessel at the time of the collision and when it ran aground. And so there are all kinds of errors that happened. And so when this oil tanker ran aground in Prince William Sound, it released almost all the crude oil in the tanks. And that amounted to about 10.8 million gallons of crude oil. Now, this is a particularly bad environmentally because Prince William Sound is mostly enclosed. It's not a wide open body of water and so just about all the oil that leaked out of this oil tanker got spread along the coast and influenced the actual coast. Uh, it soiled about 1,300 miles of coastline in Alaska and it took a long time to clean up. Cleanup efforts uh, were very slow. This is one thing that really made this whole spill worse is that they were not prepared for an oil spill here at all. Uh, a lot of people had warned them in, that uh, oil could spill in the Prince William Sound because of the amount of tanker traffic and to be prepared, and Exxon did nothing to prepare for it. They didn't have any kind of boom devices. They didn't have any kind of skimmers, nothing to control any kind of oil spill. And so Exxon was very slow to get any kind of cleanup occurring in Prince William Sound after the actual grounding, and therefore the, the oil spill turned into a much bigger environmental problem than it should have. If they were prepared, then most of this oil probably but it could have been contained and cleaned up easily. Unfortunately, as I said, most of the oil got in on the beaches or the, the rocky areas around Prince William Sound. Very difficult to clean up. Thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of man hours to clean up. They used hot water to spray the, the oil off the rocks into boomed areas and then use skimmer ships to remove the oil. And it was just a very uh, costly effort. And Exxon ended up having to pay quite a large bill, uh, $507 million for cleanup and lawsuits. A lot of fishermen and business owners in the area sued Exxon, as well as the federal government fined Exxon for that. Quite a lot of wildlife was impacted. This was one that caught my eye. Um, over 250,000 seabirds died. Thousands of sea otters died. Uh, there was uh, quite a lot of impact there. Today, when you go up to Prince William Sound, if you start digging on these rocky beaches and you dig down about a foot, you still find oil there. So the oil has not gone away. They cleaned up as much as they possibly could, but th there's no way they could have got it all. And, uh, the other thing about this is that um, Exxon really didn't suffer that much from this. This is one of the largest environmental disasters in United States history. And even though Exxon paid this fine up here, it compares nothing to their profits uh, in 2016, $7.8 billion in profit. That's profit. So this $507 million was nothing to Exxon. And it remains to be seen if Exxon has learned its lesson or not. 
to this day I still don't buy gasoline from Exxon just because of their slow response time and basically the fact that they were really sticking their heads in the sand like ostriches thinking that there's never going to be an oil spill. The other disaster I'm talking about is the Deepwater Horizon. This one's much closer to home. This one happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. You had this uh, large oil rig. It was uh, offshore. It was in some of the deepest water oil is drilled for in and it exploded. There was a problem with uh, a device called a backflow preventer and it uh, basically did not prevent a surge of natural gas to go up the well and the natural gas then exploded when it got to the top of the well. The well caught on fire and uh, eventually sank and in the process it busted off the well at the bottom of the ocean and so this well continued to leak for five months after the uh, initial disaster started, it just gushed crude oil out into the ocean for long periods of time. This was the largest marine oil spill in terms of gallons uh, worldwide, uh, over 210 million gallons, and that's just an estimate, and they think that estimate's probably low. And uh, basically, we had months of just watching video of them trying to clean up this oil spill, as well as trying to fix the leak. This is the leak down here at the well itself. You can see it was just a pipe and it's just gushing oil. What they had to do since this was so deep, no one could go down there. And people actually had to man ROVs. And you can see this arm right here that's an ROV. This remote operated vehicles that worked on this oil spill trying to put a cap on top of this well to collect the oil or to stop the actual leak. Eventually they did fashion some kind of device that sits over top the well that stopped the leak. And uh, they say it's prevented most of the oil from getting out there. Some people say there's still a little bit of a leak there. The good thing about this is that the spill, even though it was very large, it was reacted to very fast. You can see even before the rig sank, there were boats on site trying to put out the fire. The companies that were involved, they got cleanup underway pretty quickly. And most of the spill stayed offshore. Now, there were large sections in Louisiana and Mississippi and parts of northern Florida that did get oil on the coastline, but it was nothing like the Exxon Valdez where the entire coastline was just uh, soaked in oil. BP actually was fined the largest corporate fine ever for doing this, uh, and they settled for $18.7 billion dollars for this. It was a huge disaster. 11 people died on this rig when it uh, exploded and made people think twice about drilling for oil in off of Florida. And uh, these kind of disasters can happen because humans are involved and human error will always uh, be a factor. And they did prove that this was all due to human error and could have been prevented just like the Exxon Valdez. Now once we have a large oil spill, how do we clean it up? There are several different ways to do it. One of the quickest things you see happen usually is some kind of absorbent boom or barrier that floats on the surface of the water. It'll help soak up the oil. It will keep the oil contained in an area so that later on they can come and suck it out of the ocean. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the things you often see. You often see these on the beaches as well. Sometimes they'll put hay on the beach and the hay will soak up the oil. Uh, but any way, any way they can uh, contain the oil in some place or, or, or soak it up with some kind of material, that's a, a boom or some kind of absorbent. You can also do skimming. So once they collect the oil in a certain spot, then they can use some kind of mechanical means that might be attached to a boat to skim the water off. So the way this works is that these wheels rotate, and as they rotate, they pick up oil on their surface, and then later on there's a little scraper down here, and the oil goes into this little bin right here, and then they pump that into a holding tank. Later on, they can separate any kind of water that might be in that oil and use that oil again. Uh, so this is a skimming device, and so they'll have boats that have these devices, and they can remove a lot of the oil that collects on the surface. Unfortunately, another way to get rid of it is burning. This is one of the ways that they got rid of a lot of the oil from the Deepwater Horizon, is that they collected the oil using booms, and then they burned it, and they burned quite a lot of oil out in the Gulf of Mexico. Once again, this helped prevent from it getting on the ground, but all this got in the atmosphere so definitely caused air pollution there's lots of co2 there high sulfur dioxides but they did burn an awful lot of oil that created an awful lot of smoke and air pollution other things they can do is dispersants a lot of ways that they got rid of some of the oils they sprayed a dispersant over top the oil so they flew a plane over top the oil spill and they sprayed a chemical uh, called oxitent, I believe, and the, the goal of the chemical is basically to bind with the oil, break up the spill, and allow the oil to kind of sink to the bottom, where normal bacteria can then work on the oil. That's the good thing about crude oil, is that uh, bacteria will actually break down crude oil over a certain amount of time. 
the refined oil is much more toxic typically because the bacteria can't work on that because of the chemicals added to it after it's been refined. Now another thing we can start doing is working on uh, bioremediation where we use bacteria or microbes. So we actually breed these microbes and we breed them in large quantities and then these microbes can be sprayed over top the oil spill rather than these dispersants that are actually just another type of chemical. All right, another oceanic problem is marine trash. A lot of trash floats around the ocean and most of this is uh, plastics. A lot of it comes from land-based areas. Some of it can be fishing nets, fishing line that has gotten lost. We talked about ghost nets previously. This is a whole pile of fishing gear that just is floating around in the ocean. Uh, unfortunately, we saw earlier with that whale that marine mammals and marine turtles and birds and even fish can get caught in this. Uh, stuff that's floating around and it can kill them. This stuff lasts for a very long time. It takes a very long time for the sun to break it down. And then also a lot of the stuff gets ingested by wildlife. This is a picture down here of a bird that died and as it decomposed you can see all this plastic stuff that it had ingested inside its body. And then this list is a list that the Ocean Conservancy puts out about uh, the top 10 collected items when they do their annual beach cleanups. And cigarette butts, number one, and then food wrappers, drinking straws. These are just some of the things that we find on our beaches all the time in very large quantities. And all this is preventable. Usually when you go to a beach, there's not a garbage can that's that far away. And plus, if you pack it in, pack it out. I mean, you bring a cooler, or you bring a bag, just put it in a bag or bring it in your own trash bag and take it home. It's not that big an effort, and it really would prevent a lot of this stuff from getting in our oceans and really polluting one of our, our biggest resources on the planet. Well, I hope that uh, answers some questions that you have about oceanic pollution, um, oil spills, and trash. If you have any questions, we'll talk about them in class.